the throne. Come on, let's join with heaven. Come on, give him a praise. You're worthy, Jesus.
Chronicles chapter number 20, verse number 17 and 18. It says this Bible account speaks directly to our worship to the angel of armies. And when we do that, when we praise him, that is when he shows up to fight our battles. Come on, there's power in our prayer. There's power in our praise. Come on, it says Israel is about to get attacked. And King Jehoshaphat, he leads that nation to seek the Lord. God speaks, giving them specific direction. Nevertheless, what does the Lord do? He promises your victory. It says the nation responds and humbles itself, calls the worship team to the front of the line and heads out to meet the assaulting team. Come on, I want you to know this morning that we are here to lead you into the throne room this morning. But I want to challenge you this morning that if you have been walking through some things this week, it might be out of your comfort zone, but I need you to get out of your seat because there's something, there's power in stepping out and stepping to the front lines when he is showing up. Pure and simple, the enemy has been defeated, but he's better than defeated. You know what happens? The enemy turns inward and annihilates itself. Come on, I need some people who are ready to see the enemy to be defeated in this place this morning. We are here, we are in the front lines, but we are leading the way. So if you've been in the, in the battle this week, I want you to step out and I want you to step up because there's something about being in the front lines. Because when the enemy comes in like the like a flood, the enemy, the red born spirit of the Lord raises the standard. Come on, I need somebody to walk to the front and say, I am gonna stand, and the Lord is gonna fight my battle because all I gotta do is stand. All I gotta do is praise. Come on, he's holy, he's worthy of the praise. Come on, we're gonna go back to the verse two. And we're gonna lift up a hallelujah to the King of Kings. 
The whole earth sings your praise. The whole earth sings your praise. You are holy. Lift your voice. You are holy. The whole earth sings your praise. The whole earth sings your praise.
wonderful presence of God in this room right now. Man, he's here. And here's the thing. I really feel like this morning that God just wants to meet you right where you are for just another couple moments in worship. Sweet presence of the Lord here. And I don't know, I, I'm really moved today by the Holy Spirit. Even while we were praising and worshiping, there was a young man that came forward and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, he wants to give his life to the Lord. He, want, he wants to receive Jesus this morning. And this morning, I just feel like there are several other people probably in this room. Maybe maybe you aren't giving your life to the Lord for the first time, but you've been away from him for some time. You feel like he's far from you. And I've been in that place. I, I remember distinctly one time going through the motions of life kind of halfway living a Christian life and ending up at a at a, a Christian concert and just sitting there and and I remember in the middle of the singing just God being so heavy and the presence of God being just all around me and I really feel like the Lord spoke to me in that moment and said I've never left you or forsaken you. And even though you try to walk away from me sometimes, I've never left you. And God will go out of his way to meet with you. God will go out of his way to to just meet you right where you are. And I think that's what the Holy Spirit right now is trying to do. I believe that's what Jesus is trying to do right now. He'll leave 99 to go after you when you, when you have gone astray, him, you know, the, the, the story of the lost sheep, it isn't, it isn't about making the lost sheep feel bad for leaving the fold. It's about him, regardless of the situation, leaving the 99 to go after the one because he loves us that much. And today, I don't know who I might be talking to in this room, but before we move to the, to the next order of service. I just want to give you a moment. I just want to give the Holy Spirit a moment really in your life. I don't even need you to come forward. I just want you to take a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to just begin to minister to you right there at your seat. Can we just lift our hands all around this room? Can we just, those of us who maybe, maybe things are going well for us, I just want to praise God for his goodness. But there's probably somebody to your right or to your left that, that they need God to intervene in their situation. And they need to stand still and know that he is God. They need him to show up and fight a battle for them. And your praise is going to help them fight that battle. Your praise is going to set the person beside you free today. So as you worship, I just want you to worship in freedom for the next few moments and just... Thank God for his love and his mercy and his grace that goes beyond our ability to fathom. His, abil- his love for us that's so deep for us that, that he would leave 99 great sheep behind just to come after me, the one. Come on, with your hands lifted high. Lord, you're worthy. Oh, your love for us is so great.
No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't tear down, you won't tear down, coming after me.
want you to know that today. God wants you to know that. He loves you. He loves you. And greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friend. But Jesus went a step farther when while you were his enemy, when you weren't living for him, when you weren't loving him, when you were his foe, he fought for you. And he laid down his life he said, nobody takes my life. I lay it down. I lay it down for you. Man, he loves you. He loves you. And I hope you can sense his love in this room today like I sense his love in this room. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you, God, that it goes beyond our sins. I thank you, God, that your love reaches. It reaches past our inadequacies and our shortcomings and our hatred and it reaches past our prejudices and it reaches past everything that we do wrong it reaches past our hatred and our God it reaches past our idolization of things it reaches past our wrong thoughts it reaches past lust and addiction it reaches beyond all of the things God that we seem to put in front of you and your love reaches beyond all of those things it reaches your heart and we respond today with our love back to you we love you Jesus we love you God really no good way to shift things but I want us to just go back to our seats in the presence of the Lord today normally I'd have you give the Lord a hand clap praise but I really feel like in this moment we just need to let the Holy Spirit just continue to work thank you worship team Eli you can just continue to play for a moment or two special time in the Lord today if you're, if you're a guest with us today, maybe I know there's a lot of folks here because there's a, the man, the myth, the legend is in the house. So if you're here today uh, for, for whatever reason that you're here, man, we, I'm just so glad you're here. We are glad that you're here. Um, welcome. If, you, if you've never been here before. Uh, welcome. We are, we are ecstatic that you're here. If you've given your life to God even before this great man of God gets up to preach uh, or at any point in the service, uh, we want you to stick around after service ends and the welcome booth is back here. Kelly's back there. Wave at us, Kelly. And if you've given your heart or your life to God or you want to plug into the church in any way and l wonder what those next steps are, she's back there uh, to just meet and talk with you and she's got a great team to do that. And um, we'll, we'll get you pointed in the right direction. And uh, man, God is so good in this house. He's been good to us. And we have just seen the favor of the Lord. How many of y'all believe we live in the favor of God? Amen. 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 This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to give of tithe and offering in, in this place. 
not paid admission. We, you, there's no requirement to give. We simply want to give you an opportunity to give. You're giving to the kingdom of God. You're giving to this house that is called Dexter Lake Church of God. But you're giving to the kingdom of God. And God sees your giving, and he is the best accountant there ever was. I, what I love about God is he'll take the same dollar and bless it every time it changes hands if it's done in his name. I mean, he will bless the same dollar over and over and over and over again. He'll bless the same dime over and over and over again. He's just looking for somebody who wants to be charitable, who says, God, when you give it to me, I'm gonna pass it on. And he says, good, I'll bless that, I'll bless that. And that same dollar just gets transferred and blessed and transferred and blessed. And there's no lack in the economy of God. There's no lack in his ability to give. He's not, he's not bound by the dictates of our economy or our politics. We know what week it is. We know what's going on. We know what's happening in the world. But, you know, I got news for you today. If you're a believer and a child of God, we, we're not subject to the economy or the politics of this world. You know, somebody should shout amen right there. We're not, we're not subject to those things. I believe we should vote. You should vote. I think you should, I think as a citizen here, you should participate in, uh, in, in your right to vote. You should vote a biblically based vote. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. You should vote biblically. But at the end of the day, my greatest citizenship is that I'm a child of God. I've got a king. I live under a monarchy, and I don't even get to, I don't get to rule or reign. I live under a monarchy. I have a king. His name is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus Christ. And there's no voting. He's not going to be voted out. He, he has an unlimited term limit. He has no term limits, and he's, he is where he's at. He's been seated there at the glory of God the Father. And so I'm not subject to those things. And he's not subject to the economies of this world. And he can bless you in the middle of recession. I've seen him do it time and time again. He's a, he's a faithful father. He's a faithful God. So if you have anything to give, if you, would, if you feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to give of anything, tithe, offering, um, if, if you have just very little give or nothing to give, you're just as welcome. He gives seed to the sower. And he'll give you seed if you ask him to. I believe that. But today we want to pray over that gift and we want to give you a moment to just get up and, um, and there's a receptacle at the right and at the left. There's a couple receptacles in the back. There's probably a QR code uh, on the screen that you can uh, give online if you'd like to. And we want to take just about two or three minutes after I pray over the offering and let you um, get up and, and shake hands with somebody and tell them how good they look in the house of the Lord today before we get ready to engage in the word of God. So Father, in Jesus' name, I pray over the gift and the giver. God, I pray that you would uh, just abundantly bless all of those that are in this room. God, you see the heart of the giver. You're interested in our motives, not our money, God. So God, I pray right now that our motives would be blessed, Lord. I, I pray that we'd be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. God, I pray that you would just open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we can't even contain. And God, that those who give in obedience, God, that in, out of principle, you would give back to them in principle and obedience, God. We thank you for your for your love for us, God. And we you said for for you so love the world that you gave. And God, so we reciprocate that love in our giving today in Jesus' name. Amen. Said amen and amen. You can get up, shake hands with about two or three people, high five somebody, and tell them they look good in the house of the Lord today. Give of your tithe and offering on the right or the left. At this time, middle school group, if you're in middle school, you can be released over here with Pastor Danielle at the right front side, left front side, your left front side of the sanctuary. If you're in middle school, you can go to middle school class right now with Pastor Danielle over here.
Are y'all ready for the word today? That was pretty weak, but I know you're distracted, so I'm going to give you another opportunity. Y'all ready for the word today? I don't know about anybody else, but I am, I am looking forward to the word today because I get to be a partaker like everybody else of the word today. I just want to tell you, it is a great honor for me. I've been here now for two years, and it's too long for me to have gone without having the opportunity to give uh, the man of this house uh, this opportunity. So I, I, it, I'm ecstatic today uh, to just have um, a, a pioneer. And that, that, I mean that in every positive sense of the word, a pioneer for the cause of Christ. And um, many of you know him. He needs no introduction in this place. But I, I want to take this opportunity to be able to um, reintroduce him uh, in this house that, uh, together with God's help, uh, he built this, you know, in a physical, in a very uh, um, full sense of the word, he built this place. Many of you were a part of that. Many of you remember uh, those days with great fond memories. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but the anointing that, was, uh, that, that rested on Pastor Al 20 years ago uh, in this house still rests on him today. And, and I, I honor you, Pastor Al. I, I, I look at what you've done and the, uh, the evidences of God in your ministry and in your life. And, and I honor you and I look up to you. And I, I want to publicly confess that, that I, I look forward to every opportunity to glean from you. I Count it as an honor to be a part of a church that in many respect, I, I believe you built. And um, so it's my honor and pleasure today to call the, 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 the previous man of this house, the man of this hour, the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Pastor Al Wooliver, will you come and share the word with us today? Thank you. Love you, buddy. Thank you, brother. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Good to be in the house today. Uh, although I'm not sure I like that introduction because, I mean, man is fine. Myth and legend, they're kind of like has been. <laughs> Hopefully we still have a few days ahead of us to do something good for the Lord. Isn't it good to be in the presence of God? Amen. Amen. I enjoy the presence of God and I enjoy being with God's people. See, the biggest problem is that we only spend 2% of our week together. Do the math. If we're here three hours, which we probably won't be, that's only 1.79% of your week. So my influence on you, pastor's influence on you, has to be pretty, pretty significant during that short amount of exposure. So assuming that you're a person who never misses church, you love being in church, you're a Wednesday night person, you have a small group attendance, you do a few things frivolous around the, the week where you concentrate on either testifying or, or studying or writing, or you still only end up about 5% of your overall life focused directly on Jesus. That can be a challenge. And then we wonder why we have difficulties and challenges and, and ups and downs. Can I tell you that as a Christian, being in church is not the best part of your life? We've made it that. But I want to share with you something for the 96% of your life that you're going to live inside your own skin. When you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, brush your teeth, you're not doing that on behalf of everybody in the church. <laughs> You're doing that for you and maybe your significant other that will get a kiss from you. <laughs> but we've got a lot of life to live. And I think, people have asked me, how come you're so happy? I'm happy because I like being me. Good. Not because I'm so great, but because I died and let Christ have rule over my life, amen. <laughs> I'm going to give you the key 
to a joyful life. How many of you would like to wake up Tuesday morning and say, hallelujah, it's just like Sunday, amen? Amen. I'm going to give you that key today, and it's my responsibility, it's every pastor's responsibility, to pass on something that's better than Sunday morning. Now, I mean, I love church. Don't get me wrong. I've been going to church for almost 60 years. But this isn't the best part of my life. And I want to share that with you this morning. Because it's not church that died for you, Jesus did. More importantly, it's not just he who died, but he rose again. And the life that we now live, whoo, think about that, in the flesh. In the beginning, John 1 and 1, if you're going to read with me, John 1 and 1 and John 1, 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In fact, the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Man, how much better can you get? I could go home and say hallelujah. That's all the food you need. In the beginning, it started with the word. Think about the immensity of this phrase. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Word, what, how do words come into our life? Someone speaks them, don't they? So in the beginning of of man's part of this eternal thing we call God was a word. And and God said, let there be light. That's all he did. He didn't go into the chemistry lab and figure out how he was going to make light. He just spoke. Can I tell you that your faith life ought to be automatic like that? Do you think it's harder for him to do something in your life than it was for turn on the lights in the universe? Come on. Come on. Let there be light. There was light. Let's divide the heavens from the earth. Let's let's fill the ocean with life. Let's make the earth green. I like green. Let's make the earth green. Let's fill it with animals and critters. And you know what? This is awesome. In fact, at the end of every stage he said, Man, this is good. But then he did something different. He shifted gears. And he, have you ever talked to yourself? (laughs) Oh, yeah, I do. I preach to myself. And, And God says to himself, he says, self, let's do this a little different. Let's make man in our When you look in the mirror and you let some fool tell you you ought to be depressed and stressed, and you're 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 lying to God. You're made in His image. Don't let somebody tell you you aren't what you ought to be. You're exactly what you ought to be. You're made in the image of God. So this is all in the beginning. I mean, we haven't even got to point two yet. In the beginning, God. What did He do? He spoke. And that word created everything we know. Then John 1, 14, you jump ahead about 6,000 years, and the word became flesh. You remember a thousand years with the Lord is a day, and a day is a thousand years? So this wasn't like God said, oh, I got a good idea. Why don't I send my son? From the foundation of the world, When when God made the world, he did something very special. He said, I'm going to let you and you and you and you and you choose for yourself. I don't want anyone in my kingdom that doesn't choose to be there. So I'm going to give you the right to say no. Now, there will be a terrible price, but (laughs) I'm going to give you the right to say no. But in order to make it possible for you to say yes and mean it and keep it, then I'm going to send my son. See, because God... His justice cannot be sidestepped. If he said the soul that sins, it will surely die. It's going to die. You can count on it. And God can't stop that. But he can substitute that. And Jesus came to take care of your sin and mine. So the word became flesh. 
We beheld his glory. Can I tell you the world honors Jesus every day and they don't even know it? God damn it. Do you see what they just did? They didn't say Kennedy damn, Johnson damn, Bahama dead. They didn't do that. They know in their knower that only God has the power to give life or damn. I bet you never heard that in church before, have you? (laughs) But you hear it every day if you work in the world. And they are going to be judged by the words of their own mouth. They have declared the sovereignty of God over everything in the world. When they get mad and blurt out the name of Jesus in vanity and disgust, do you realize that they're hammering another evidence against the wall when the end comes and they stand before God? And they go, nobody told me. Nobody had to tell you. You've been using my name all your life. See, the gospel is pretty simple. God is everywhere. You remember what Paul said one time? There was, he says, you know, he says, everybody's preaching. Now he says, some are preaching because they love God. Some are preaching because they love me. And some are preaching to increase my burden. That's what he said. So I'm telling you, friends, Jesus is the real thing. I've been around the world several times. And guess what? You can go to Hong Kong, hear people take Jesus' name in vain. Oh, well, we're Buddhists. Well, I don't matter. You still honor God more than you honor Buddha. Listen, the word is so important. It's what's going to fill 96% of your life. Why did the word become flesh? Jesus did not have to say the word became flesh. Listen to this. Let's let Jesus answer that question. He lived, he died, and he was resurrected. But why did he do it? For God so loved the world. He didn't do it so he could prove you were wrong. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? But Jesus didn't stop there. He said, I want you to understand the other side. For God did not come to condemn the world. Well, if I I go to church, I got to quit this and I got to quit that. If I become a Christian, I can't do this and I can't do it. Let me tell you, whatever God might remove from your life is only to make room for something 25 times better than what you had before. (laughs) Jesus also said, And this is the part that's going to help you 96% of the week. Most assuredly. That's like God saying amen at his own preaching. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you at all. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise him up in the last day day. In the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh. And then the flesh one day said, I got to go away so the helper will come. So, and drink my blood. That wasn't morbid. He was literally given the illustration of there's nothing more important for your nourishment than the word of God. You can come to church once a week and get it, or you can get it every morning when you drag your body out of bed. You can live in the excuse of, I just can't make it. I got to get to church Sunday. Oh God, I'm about ready to fall over and die. What's your own fault? You don't eat when you're gone. Can you imagine eating one meal a week? You'd be puny and sickly. And that's why Christians are puny and weak. 
It's why victory is in our song. It's why our conversations were eaten up by what the world's doing and how sick my body is and how broken my life is because we don't put the word in our life over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then we blame the preacher for not keeping us alive. I could get preachy here in a minute. Help me out, Pastor. Give me what you're going to give me. You see, the word is an experience. Y'all just going to have to tolerate this. See what that is? See what that is? Thank you, Pastor. (laughs) Wow, was that good? Ice cream. There's nothing better in the whole wide world. Ice cream. It's not fair. Oh, thank you for saying that. Hang on to that thought. You're just going to have to watch me. Chocolate. My goodness. Melt in your mouth. Feels good in your belly. Strawberry. Did you like that, Beth? Oh, that's good, isn't it? You know what? I didn't get very much vanilla, but there's a little in there. Man, I bet nobody ever ate ice cream in church in front of you before, have they? I know. Y'all going to leave here and go to Dairy Queen. My goodness, I wish I'd have put more on that. Mm. Wow, I ain't preaching that sweet, so it don't matter. And I can tell you, the preacher wouldn't want me sitting back there eating ice cream while he's preaching. Here, hold that, brother. Now, did you see what I just did? That's good. I didn't know he would do that, but I'm glad he did. Because what I just did is what the preacher does for you every Sunday morning. He whets your appetite for the word of God. But friend, he's not going home with you and going to spoon feed you. You can go home, wipe your lips, say, man, that looked good. Woo! I wish I had me some ice cream, but you're going to have to reach in your pocket, pull out a dime and put it on the counter. Well, I'm an old man. It used to be a dime. Now it's $4. But You see, the word can't help you if you don't eat my body and drink my blood. All of us are random. And the word became flesh. And you all seen his glory. Al brought ice cream and you all seen the joy it put on his face. (laughs) But if you don't go home and get some for your own self, all you're going to have is a story about someone else. The word is not an intellectual argument or pursuit to God. The word is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He put it in that form so we could partake of it anywhere and everywhere. It's not for us to just do on Sunday morning. Psalm 34 and 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, have you ever tried to describe to someone how something tastes? Usually ends up, well, it tastes kind of like chicken. 
But friend, when you taste it for yourself, it's a whole different animal. And I'm here to tell you that what the church needs is to get back to that point where the first thing they do every morning, well, I'm not a morning person, well, become an morning person. In the morning, Jesus rose from the grave. In the morning, he's waiting to cover you for the day. Set your blooming alarm clock a half hour early, get up and read a chapter in the book and pray. Don't come whining to me. Pray for me, Pastor. Okay, you ain't prayed for your own self yet. We're building an army, not a hospital. I get so sick of people saying, well, the church is a hospital. It ain't no hospital. It's boot camp. Stop coming up here and asking me over and over and over again when the word of God will empower you and enable you and equip you, hallelujah. God ain't coming back for a bunch of sissies that are moaning and groaning and whining. He's coming back for a church triumphant. Read it in the book. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. See, we've made religion replace Jesus. But I can just get up there. Somebody will help me. Well, if you just get down in front of Jesus, he will help you. And then you can get off your duff and be a help to someone else. I didn't plan this, but I'm going to tell you a story. There was a demoniac. And he was so bad they couldn't chain him up. He lived in the graveyard. You couldn't even have a decent funeral in that town without him messing with you. Jesus steps out on the shore. He trembles in fear, falls down at his feet. Jesus casts out the demons. And then after a few hours of interaction, he said, I want to go with you, Jesus. He said, no, go back to your friends. How many friends does that rascal have? Can I tell you that God wants to enable and empower us? You know, every person he healed, he said, go and sin no more or take up your bed and walk or go do for yourself. We're built a church full of mamby-pambies that want someone else to do everything for them. The word enables and empowers and lifts up and equips. We're the church triumphant. I'm not going to drag into heaven and drag you with me. You want to go with me? March. You want to have a happy life? Get rid of the stuff that keeps you from being happy. Watch this. The word is a fortress. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, some of y'all, and I don't, I don't want to look, but some of y'all have been failing the same old junk over and over and over again. You know why? Because the word hasn't been hidden in your heart. You're getting the word at Sunday. You're getting the word from a friend who holds your hands while you're pouting, but you don't get the word yourself. Come on. Come on. It says, I hid the word in my heart. That don't mean I sat on my duff in the seventh row hoping the preacher can touch me today, bless God. I sure hope that singing's good today because man, I need it. Well, get a song in your own heart. If y'all come to church prayed up, my God, ain't no telling what kind of miracles could take place in the house. word hidden in my heart. You didn't give it to me. You didn't give it to me. You didn't give it to me. I found it my own self. Your word have I hidden in my heart. Why? So I won't sin against you. Guess what? Sin leads to death, don't it? So you want to know how that happens? Christians die to self, then they're born again. Galatians 2.20, one of my absolutely all-time favorite verses. I have been crucified with Christ. 
Most of us want Christ to man be pambious. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Listen, say it with me. Live in the flesh. Say it again. Live in the flesh. Live in the flesh. You don't have to wait to go to heaven to have some glory in the flesh. That's right. And the life that I now, whew, right now, 2024. Hallelujah. I love you, Pastor. But I'm going to order another month. Hallelujah. And you can have winter and you can have all these people too. <laughs> but I'm taking Jesus. <laughs> and if I can't leave some for you right now, you'll be all winter starving to death. Because I'm going to live my life in the flesh through Christ. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live through Christ. That's, that's one. Number two, being a Christian is not about trying to be good. Too many people out there say, well, I just got to quit doing this. I got to quit doing that. What you got to do is start getting the word in your heart and you won't want to do that. God don't make any demands on you to quit. He gives you a desire to walk higher. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, that won't happen until you start putting the word in. You'll walk by and say, man, that little preacher got red faced and he made me smile and we laughed. And my God even ate ice cream in front of me <laughs> and made me like it. <laughs> That's not going to do you any good. until the word begins to transform by the renewing of your mind. Stinking thinking is keeping people off the happy train. Come on. Come on. Oh, hallelujah, friend. I love you more than I love life. But you got to stop stinking thinking. The word needs to permeate who you are until it begins to transform Amen. who you are. And watch what happens when it transforms. That you may be able to prove what is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God. You see, we can become the reflection of God's word. Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. It's not talk about get me to the right church where I can feel good Sunday morning. Do something in me, Lord. Let the words of my mouth. You notice the personal pronoun? It's not our, it's not we, it's not us. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart. See, you can say sweet things to me and you might inside just hate me. Come on. Oh, good job, pastor. And then walk out and say, my God, that guy's crazy. He wants too much out of me. I don't want anything out of you. I'm going to go home and have lunch. I don't care if you starve to death or not. I'm going to be happy. It's me and Jesus. And until you get greedy for the things of God, you are never going to know the joy of the Holy Ghost that is your strength. But this gets good. We can reflect the word of God in our speech. Watch this one. This is a big one. In our decisions. How many of you heard this phrase? Well, they're not a bad person. They just made some bad decisions. Yeah, y'all laughing. Somebody got your hands over your face. I know who you are. I've been there myself. Well, he's a really good person. He's just made some bad decisions. Well, let me tell you, good persons with bad decisions are going to hell. That's right. We can't blame the circumstances around us. Something just jumped in my head that probably shouldn't have. But I look back and see my old friend. Emphasis on old and friend. 
Ed, you're a quiet guy. But I'm telling you, if any of you want to learn how to serve Jesus, you follow this guy around. This last couple years has been hell on earth. But Ed and I have had the privilege of working together a little on some projects. And I can tell you he's the same every day of the week. He don't get dressed up on Sunday and become Ed we all admire and love. He is Ed, the born again, blood bought, spirit filled, Christian man of God. Every day, through every circumstance. And there's a bunch of you I could call out like that. This is just the one the Lord pointed out to me. Can I tell you that we are the church triumphant? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And yea, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Stop testifying for the devil. Constantly moaning and groaning about things around you. You got some things you can change. You got some things you can't. But one thing you can do is walk in victory every day through it. Amen. We can reflect the word in our speech, in our decision, in our daily life. But only if we meditate on the word. Meditate's just a real fancy religious word for think. Remember remember the old t-shirts, hats, and and bracelets? WWJD. They took a great word and ruined it. They made it something everybody wanted to wear. Sold millions, somebody made a fortune. But it ruined the concept of people just simply slowing down and saying, I wonder what Jesus would do. It became a byword instead of the word. Friend, we ought to go back. Don't buy another bracelet. But you ought to ask yourself, what would Jesus do today? How can I That's meditate. How can I make the word a part of my tangible life? What can I do? What can I say? What kind of decision can I make that would make Jesus happy that I've done it? You know, y'all, and I'm not criticizing this, but y'all say, come on, dance if you're free. Lord Jesus, we can't even pray in our home free. Christians are embarrassed to pray. Will you pray? Oh, Oh, I can't do that. My Lord in heaven, if you can't call on the name of Jesus, how deep is your faith? Hey, this thing's real, folks. You want to be happy? You got to die. Stop pleasing the flesh. And the life which I now live, I've been crucified with Christ. The life which I now live. You see, there's a transition period. I'm going to close and y'all going to be glad. I love this little passage. It is so small and almost insignificant. But it is the picture of the greatest faith in God's word. Jesus was a child. And at the appropriate time, they took him to the temple like every good Jewish family. And when they walked in, something weird happened. There was this old man named Simeon. Most people had just forgot that he hung out at the temple all the time. And guess what happened? When he seen Jesus, guess what he did? He ran over and took that baby out of mama's hands, a total stranger. Some crazy old man at church. Not only did he pick him up, but he raised him up. He said, now I can die. I've seen my salvation. Oh God, help us see our individual salvation. Unity is a wonderful thing. Church is a wonderful thing. Being together is a wonderful thing. But if it don't work Tuesday afternoon when the boss treats you bad, you don't have it, friend. Watch this. This is the part I like the best. I 
can die now I've seen the salvation of the Lord and guess what happened here you can have him back no explanation no declaration no theological reasoning no Old Testament proof that this New Testament thing he had an insurance in his inner man that was so rich he didn't care who thought he was crazy he didn't care what other people might have thought about what he said he was in presence of God see until you get it like that you ain't got it This can be a great church, but it won't because he's a great pastor. It'll be because he sets the table and you slide up and eat. I don't get this opportunity real often, so I wanna tell you with all my heart, I love you. I love this church. I love the vision that God gave us way back on Evanston. I love the fact that some that I look out here were there when we ran 50. And we're still here when we ran 1,200. Can I tell you it's still God's will for us to take this city? You remember that series of sermons? Do you know it's still God's will for us to be an army that marches together? It's still God's will that victory be our song, not our hope, not our tomorrow, but today. And now I'm going to tell you the secret. I've never said this publicly. The secret is not in you running to the altar. All that does is make you feel better. The secret is taking this home with you and letting it nag you while you're trying to watch the afternoon football game. It's going to wake you up in the middle of the night. And your prayer won't be some Mamby Pamby. Now I lay me down to sleep prayer. Your prayer might not even have words, but your prayer may be the convulsion of your soul before an all knowing God that can see deeper than you even see your own self. That's what makes a great church. That's what makes a congregation turn into a unified body. And I'll quit preaching for me. (laughs) We are the army of God, friends. All that conquering talk, that's not about some private thing. Everybody, I'm going to say this, man, this is radical. Everybody in town ought to envy your relationship with each other. When they see you, They ought to say, man, I sure wish I had some of what he's got. I know these folks for a day or two. Look at that. First thing he did was squeeze up. (laughs) Them guys are a picture of what a couple ought to be. I love you guys. You have been so precious to me. I could go around my Lord all the room from young chicks like Ruth. Stand together with me so I can quit. You have to personal with your faith. You don't need my approval and I don't need yours. What we need is to live our lives so if our last breath comes at 104, or this afternoon at two o'clock, 
the first thing we hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things, but I'll make you a ruler over many things. I love y'all. I hope I've left you with something that will cause you to go home and open the book. Start a family Bible, sit down, read. Don't give me this old junk that you, I don't understand it. You don't have to understand it. Get it in, the Holy Spirit will bring it out when you need it, amen. If you will, take the person beside you by the hand. It's all right if I just dismiss, because I want you to go home with this. Pastor sets the table by serving the word, but only we can eat it. The choice is ours. The bounty that is in the word or the emptiness that is in self. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for this awesome group of people who are hungry for the deep things of God. Let your word penetrate and kill the flesh until our spirit is buoyant in this heavy world. Bless these folks, bless their families, their homes, their friends, their businesses. Lord, let everything they touch shine with the glory of God that you might be glorified in their lives. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for having me come. Amen. Can we give it up for Pastor Al? He is such a blessing to us here at Dexter Lake. What a legacy. We are so honored. Thank you, Pastor Oliver, for being with us today. I have just a couple quick announcements for you because it is the most wonderful time of year. Everybody say jingle bling. I know. We do have jingle bling signs in the back at the Connect Center that we need to get out. Um, Sister Lop is holding them up right now. Also, in the Connect Center, we have a lot of glasses. So if you are having trouble reading the mighty, powerful, wonderful Word of God, your glasses are probably back there. We have quite a collection, so please go back there. Also, say hi to Kelly if you are a first-time guest. We want to honor you with a gift, and we want you to be prepared for next Sunday. We will need help moving the chairs out of the sanctuary. So next Sunday, if you can help us plan, just go ahead and plan on staying, being with us, and helping us move the chairs on out. We also have pie night this Wednesday. Everybody say, bring a pie, eat a pie. Amen. It is such a good time of fellowship. The whole premise of pie night is literally gathering together and eating pie. So make plans to be there. There will be no Wednesday night classes but um, we will be eating pie. That is at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. It's such just a wonderful time to come together in this season and be with one another. It's a gift, it's an honor. We also do have Jingle Bling on the 16th. Sister Deidre has posted the donation list. So go ahead and make sure you're claiming items, bringing them in and helping us make this event just such a wonderful, blessed time. We also want to invite you to come serve at Jingle Bling. It is great time of coming together, serving our community, allowing people to buy gifts, and just, it's awesome. It's awesome. It also funds our women's conference. Amen. How many women love the conference? Yes. This is how we pay for that. So thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for helping us in that. And Men on Fire, it is this Thursday at 6 p.m. Men, you guys have two events a month, and this is one of them this week. If you are, if you come to Men on Fire, can you just say, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can't wait to see you there. It is going to be awesome. It's going to be a blessed time. I also want to say thank you to everybody who brought candy and helped with GlowQuest. We had salvations at our fall outreach this year. Can we just give it up for God? Hallelujah. He is good. He is mighty. He is holy. And he is moving. We had salvations today. We are so thankful that you joined us for church today and that you are a part of our family and that you do life connected with us. If you have any questions, feel free to see me. I am Pastor Danielle, the children's pastor. I would love to connect with you for new family here at Dexter as well. Be blessed and we will see you for pie night. Amen. Amen.